Thing making claims and working to support them with evidence, she says. I'm thinking I have a lot of points I want to argue to Principal Measley, but it doesn't matter how much evidence our team has on any of our points about why we deserve new uniforms too, or as many practice days as the boys, or a say in our jersey numbers or positions. If he's not listening, and he's not listening, Miss Kravitz joins in to say. You can gather evidence in lots of different ways. For example, if I'm trying to argue that my dog is energetic, I might use my senses to prove it and jot down some things I see or things I hear. She points to her eyes, then her ears. For example, I might jot down that he nudges me awake at five o'clock every morning, or that he wags his tail so hard it knocks over everything on the coffee table. Everyone laughs. She draws a chart in her notebook, and we all know to copy it down in ours. Let's practice with someone in your own life. Under name, jot down a family member or a friend or anyone you know. I jot down Grandma B. Now think of a word that describes that person. A trait. Positive. Now write one way you know that. Think of things you see them do or hear them say. Grandma B's threes. I write. Ms. Blaze is walking around and helping some kids with their charts, and Ms. Kravitz is having a conference with Maddie's table to help them brainstorm some describing words. I'm done, so I add more people to my page. Name: Grandma B. Trait: Positive. Evidence: Grandma B's threes. Name. Mom, trait, strong, evidence, ambulance driver, stands up for me, can do tons of push-ups. Name, Aunt Tam, trait, loyal, evidence, walked with Mom when I cried all night, friends forever. I almost add that Bryce is annoying and A is show-offy, but I don't. Even though I have evidence to prove it, because I'm trying to be more like Jess from my book, and I'm starting to realize there is maybe more to them than just that. Then, as I'm writing, an idea comes flashing into my head, so I wave for Maximilian's TI eighty four and punch in a new part to our plan. Keep writing Measley's notes. He reads it and raises his eyebrows like what? I punch more into the calculator and slide it back to him. He smiles and gives me a big thumbs up. He even lets me pass his calculator around to Cece and Quinn and A and Georgia and Tess and Fern. I watch them as they read the screen and then look up to catch my eye and smile. At the end of class, Ms. Blaze checks in on my notebook. That's quite a lineup, she says. You're lucky. I nod. And as she moves on to Maximilian's notebook, I jot down my own name on the page, B, and then Lucky, and all my evidence is already there. Grandma B, Mom, Aunt Tam. I bring Principal Measley's notebook to recess and tear out the diagram of the field I drew yesterday at practice with all our positions on it. Then I give the notebook to Maximilian, and the crumpled piece of paper with his horrible notes jotted next to our names and jersey numbers. Copy them back in, I tell him. Maximilian nods and sits against the bricks of the school, getting straight to work. And I find Emmy and Micah and Nell, who say they'll spread the word to the rest of the team. At the end of recess, Maximilian keeps Measley's notebook, but hands me back the original wrinkly page with the mean comments. I crumple it again into the tiniest ball I can and stuff it deep down in my backpack. When I get my reading notebook back at the end of the day, I see Ms. Blaze's handwriting and I smile before I even read it, because I know she wrote it from the bench supervising our soccer practice. B. I'm so glad you're enjoying Bridge to Terabithia. This is some smart thinking, and I believe you're right. People aren't ever just one thing, not even main characters who we love, not even bullies. People are complicated, 
and usually worth taking the time to get to know. Keep it up, Ms. Blaze. I'm trying to remember this at practice after school, but I'm pretty sure Principal Measley is just one thing. Or maybe he is more complicated because he's mean and grumpy and a bad listener. But I'll tell you one thing. I don't think he's worth taking the time to get to know, because instead of looking at the diagram I'm showing him from yesterday or listening to us about our positions and how we practiced moving like a team, he's holding up a whiteboard and drawing little X's and saying we're going to run a 6-3-1 with the three midfielders playing defensively. A and I scoff and say, are you kidding? Because what that means is six defenders, three midfielders, and one lone striker. What that means is he doesn't have confidence we'll score any goals, so he's just stacking us back in front of our own goal. Before you start getting fancy with offense, let's see if between the 11 of you on the field, you can manage to keep the ball from going in your own net. I look at Maximilian. He writes that down, and I give him a nod like he's got this. Principal Measley is asking for his notes from Tuesday, and Maximilian turns back to the first page in the notebook, the one he rewrote during recess time. Measley starts calling out the numbers on our wrinkled, oversized jerseys and pointing to spots on the field. Even though my number one has been through the wash, it still smells like decades of boys. How come the boys are getting new uniforms? I ask. He pulls the whistle around his neck and answers, Two teams, two sets of jerseys. But how come we got the old ones? Tess asks. You just got a new team. Now you want new jerseys? He shakes his head. You can always fundraise. I'm happy to give you the name of the place we order from. Did the boys fundraise for theirs? A asks. But he just blows his whistle. Number 21! He calls, then points to the middle circle. Striker! I tried to tell him that number 21 has a name, and it's Quinn, and she's actually a defensive back. But he's already pointing and shouting, Number 12! Number 10! Sweepers! We're running two sweepers! Number 10 is Cece, A tells him. You have to explain that to her. Measley looks at Cece, and I can tell he doesn't have one idea about how to talk to her. Tell her it's the last defender before the goalie and not to let anyone by, he says. Maximilian sneaks a couple of quick jots in the notebook. Georgia looks at Cece, then she points to the goal and then to the spot in front of it and acts out like she's a defender. And Cece reacts with her whole face and body in a way that says, Me? Sweeper? Nell says, actually, I'm the sweeper. Principal Measley looks at her jersey and says, Number 13, your first sub, and points to the bench. Then he points at me. Number one, keeper. I bite my tongue in the back of my mouth, and before we go out to our new positions, A brings us into a huddle and says, We'll practice it the way he wants, and if it's not working, we know our positions and can switch it up during games. What's he going to do? We all nod, and Jamie looks at Cece and pretends the fingers on her hands are players all lined up on the field, then acts out switching up positions. She points to her eyes and then to all of our eyes. Pay attention. Watch each other. Cece smiles, then reaches her hand in the middle. Line up! Let's go! Principal Measley calls. We all reach our hands to the middle with CCs, then do our one, two, three bounces and team. We finish the sign, our fists closing the circle all at the same time. And even though it's silent, I swear it sounds loud. You all don't need a cheer for practice! Measley calls. And Georgia calls back. Get in the spirit, Principal Measley. We've got some games to win. That makes him laugh, but we just keep running out to set up a ridiculous 6-3-1 formation, waiting to get some touches on the ball. I run past A and mutter, this is some bullsharky. And Cece looks at us and draws a question mark in the air. 
I point around the field at our formation, then use my index fingers to make two bullhorns on my head and paw my foot in the grass like I am about to charge. Then I sign a blast from the back of my shorts. Bull sharky. Cece laughs and shows us the real sign for that, which looks exactly like a pooping bull and involves a blast from her elbow. Then she throws her fingers up on her head and pretends she's a real bull. She paws her cleat on the ground, and it brings up grass. Then it catches, and Quinn's doing it, and Georgia, and then Nell from the bench. And together, we are a herd of bulls, sick of this sharky, ready to charge. Sixteen. When I get home, Cameron has his swim relay team over, and they're taking up the whole kitchen, making pasta for carbo-loading. You guys know my dad, Cameron says to the guys. Then Bryce comes downstairs, and my brother Bryce. They all say, yeah, and hi. And then he says, this is my relay team. Dodger and Roscoe and Fred barge in, and Cameron laughs and says, and these are our zillion pets. Then he points to me and says, and this is B. I say hi and nice to meet you. But really, I'm feeling weird in my own kitchen because everyone else has a title. Dad and brother, and even the relay team and the dogs and Fred. And I'm just B. B is Louise's daughter, Cameron adds. B, who comes with an explanation. They all nod like they get it now. And Mom comes in, and then Tucker gets home from band practice. And as if our house wasn't crowded enough before, we now have nine people, two dogs, a cat, and two gigantic pots of water that are about to boil over in the kitchen. Cameron turns down the heat and empties boxes of spaghetti into the pots, and Mom gestures for me to come over. So I weave a path through everyone in the kitchen and follow her to the living room. How was it? She asks. Terrible, I say. He wants to run a 6-3-1 because he thinks we don't have a chance of scoring. Bryce escapes the kitchen, too, and plops down on the rug. Dodger and Roscoe sit right in his lap like they're still puppies. It kind of feels weird to talk about Measley in front of Bryce, but I just keep telling Mom everything. I tell her about how he wouldn't listen to us about our positions, and how we got old uniforms and the boys are getting new ones, and he told us we could fundraise if we wanted. I can tell that Mom's biting down hard on her tongue in the back of her mouth, and then she picks up a pillow from the couch and screams into it. Bryce and both dogs swing their heads toward Mom, but Bryce kind of looks away fast, like he isn't sure he was supposed to see that, or he doesn't know what he's supposed to say, so he scratches Roscoe behind the ear and gives Dodger a belly rub. I really have to call the school, she says. I mean, I'm your mom. I look right back at her and say, I really got this, Mom. I mean, I'm your daughter. She pulls me in for a hug and says, Ember's all right, but you just say the word. And she lifts a pretend phone to her ear. Cameron comes in with his team and says, We're about to watch some swim videos from practice. You all are totally welcome to watch if you want. They're holding big bowls of pasta. There's extra in the kitchen, too. Tucker says he'll watch, and Wendell sits down next to Mom on the couch and says, Sounds interesting to me. And the swimmers all sit their long bodies down on the floor next to Bryce. He shoes the dogs to the mudroom, and by the second video of Cameron flying into the wall with a two-hand touch, we're all twirling spaghetti around our forks and inspecting the team's relay starts like it's the Olympics. We watch until our bowls are empty. Then we leave Cameron and his teammates to themselves when they start discussing splits and times and the team that beat them last year. Bryce goes up to his room, and I wait a minute, then go up too, because it would feel weird to walk up right behind him. But when I get to the top of the stairs, his door is open, and I peek in, even though I don't really mean to. And he's propped up on his bed, reading on the iPad with his earbuds in. He catches my eye and looks away. But then he takes out his right earbud and says, What? What are you reading? I ask.
He shakes his head and says, nothing. And I'm thinking that would be just like him, to use a teacher's iPad to pretend to read a book. But really, he's watching stupid videos or listening to music instead, because Bryce Valentine gets away with everything. I turn to go, but Bryce says, smile. Excuse me? I say. The book's called Smile, he says. Oh, I say. Is it good? He shrugs his shoulders like whatever or it's fine, but I know he has to like it more than that because he's reading at home. But I read something different in school, he says. Why? He shrugs his shoulders again, and Fred hops up on his bed and snuggles around his neck like he's a scarf. Just do. Okay. I turn to go to my room, but Bryce calls out again. It's about this girl who fell on her face and broke her teeth and has to do all these surgeries and stuff, and her friends are teasing her about all sorts of things. Sounds pretty good, I say. Yeah, it is. Ms. Kravitz recommended it. Then he looks down at the iPad. Kenny and Maura say it's a girl book, though. That's because they share three brain cells, I tell him, and I hold up three fingers like you do in American Sign Language with your thumb. That makes Bryce laugh, which makes me laugh a little, too. too. I'm reading a book about a boy, I tell him. His name is Jess, and he likes to run and draw, and his own dad makes fun of him for that. And he has this best friend named Leslie, and she's a girl, and their friendship is kind of like mine with Maximilian. Bryce nods. And I think Jess might kind of be a bully to this one girl, but I think by the end he'll quit it because I can tell he's good. Bryce nods again and says it sounds like a decent book. I see the stack of notebooks on his desk, and I'm pretty sure he doesn't notice that they're out of order or anything from when I knocked them down. And I'm wondering why he keeps that picture in there, and if maybe it's because it's too hard to look at and you can only do it in little bits at a time before you have to stuff it away again. And when I look back at Bryce for a hundredth of a second, I swear I can see that little baby from the photo right there in his face. Well, good night, he says. Good night, I say. And I head back to my room and take out Bridge to Terabithia. And for some reason, it doesn't feel so bad. The fact that I share a wall with Bryce Valentine. 17.